Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching. Please go hit that like and subscribe button wherever you get your show. So, like always, let's kick it off with our Patreon question of the day, which is, what is something that your child has done in public to embarrass you? Dang. <laughs> Let's see. I had a call from a PE coach once. Uh, are we allowed to say inappropriate words? Yeah, Not yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess my son at eight cussed at another kid and said, I'm going to put my d in your butt. <laughs> my oh my yeah, my nuts in your butt. That's what he said. I'm going to oh put my, my nuts in your butt. And the call for that was like, he said, yeah. like, Mr. Vargas, I need you to talk to your son. He just said something super inappropriate. I'm like, okay, what'd he say? He said, well, I'm going to let him say it. And then he couldn't say it. He didn't want to say it. And then the, the teacher got the phone back. He, he said, he said he wants to put his nuts in, in, in another guy's butts. And I was like, I'm on my way to pick him up. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I picked him up I'll from be right school. There. We sat down and we had a conversation about like, do you know what you're saying? <laughs> he had no clue on the bro. Don't say that, man. Like, don't say. It. Everyone at the school already knew because when I walked in, like everyone behind the, the you know, the the principal, the assistant, everyone knew, and they're all laughing and giggling under the breath. And I'm like, Jesus, what is wrong yeah. with this kid? <laughs> when you get called in. The, the, the dad's expressions are the best. We're like what? <laughs> <laughs> well, and where did he hear that from? Well, who who freaking that's a compilation yeah. of some stuff put together, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's got all the brothers and sisters and yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, who I'm knows, just, man? Like, away. I was like, what did he say that for? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I figure at that age, man, you're still learning how to cuss. You're still learning how to talk and put everything together to make it sound tough and 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 right. It's almost like a foreigner who doesn't speak English who tries to cuss somebody in English. It doesn't <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm talking about? It just Yeah. That is yep. hilarious. Oh my gosh. I can't remember if anything that well, I, any of my kids. Axe, have, Axe took a. So, Axe, one time, this is an embarrassing story for I, I both of us. I thought he was us. there. What? No, because this was Sons of Anarchy. This was before Range 15. Yeah, but I thought. Oh, that's right. All right, that's right. Yeah, so this was Boot Campaign had an event. This was back in 2010. And Sons of Anarchy was real, real hot. And they did a collaboration with the boot campaign, the Sons of Anarchy cast, and the boot campaign did this motorcycle ride down, what's the famous highway in LA? The LA freeway, the, the five. The five or whatever, whatever that big famous, you know, the big highway. And they shut the highway off. Every like, lane. The police the shut it down for us to do this motorcycle ride. It was like a big charity campaign for the boot campaign. Anyway, it's this real big deal. And I don't know her real name, but Peg Bundy was there. And she was in San yeah. yeah, she was in San Sons of Anarchy. And Marcus had the biggest crush on her in high school. And we're on the red carpet. Marcus is holding Axe. My son, yeah, one of my youngest boy. He was he was a baby. He was a baby. Still in diapers. Time. Yeah, like just and he shit and puked all over me, man, on the on the red carpet. Yeah. Yeah. And it was then, a good one. And then Marcus hands him over to me. I'm like, me. hey, take this. Yeah. So <laughs> I have vomit all over me. And I go into the bathroom and I'm washing this naked baby off. And here comes Peg Bundy. And she looks so glamorous and beautiful. And I have vomit in my hair and all over my shirt. And a naked baby in the sink. And I looked up and I said, oh, you're so beautiful. And my <laughs> husband had the biggest crush on you. I did. And I looked so helpless i look like a homeless person at that yeah moment, that but. woman helped get me through puberty hey I, I tell you what I, I, I never got a chance to hang out with her but my son was butt naked in the bathroom with her you know yes. that's that's a that's a qual <laughs> i think count for it had to jump a generation for yeah. me to even get a chance to you know truly get to know her yeah. or for her to get to know me how about that that was an embarrassing <laughs> moment for me because i was like I held this woman up on a pedestal and here I am with vomit all over me with my naked baby in a sink. That's usually when you get to meet the one you want, right? <laughs> you're in a compromised moment. You're like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. That's funny. So today we have Vincent Rocco Vargas. You may know him as one of the stars from Mayans, but before that he also served as an army ranger, border patrol agent, and now he's an actor, writer, producer, and even has a new book coming out November 14th, which we'll get into. Um, so welcome to the show, Vincent. 
Thank you for having me. Thank Man, you. have you have you has anybody ever read your resume out loud to you? <laughs> no, it's it, ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I did this the other day to a guy too. I was like, "Hey, man, I read it, one of one of ours, and yeah. I, I write, it's the first time." And we've been buddies for a while. Yeah, and I know <laughs> what you do, and I know what you've done, but you don't ever. I guess we break it down into sections normally, but when you when it's written in front of you and you got to read this out, you're like, "Hey, bro," I was like, "Man, you give it a pretty good run." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm living several lives. I mean, how like. about that? That if if you talk about the American dream. I was talking about this about Schwarzenegger. Say what you want about him, man. I thought he was great when he came in and the way he did it from nothing and did all that, accomplished all that. It's what America is all about. Yep, absolutely. I mean, you're same same realm. Jump and people are scared to death from go from one position to the other to the other. But in reality, that's the best part about being an American. So I, yeah. where'd you join the army at? Uh, I joined the army. In, well, I was in Kentucky when I joined, but I was playing baseball out there at a college, and I lost my full ride, and so I just joined the military right after. When was this? That was in two thousand three. Check. Why? Why yeah. the ar- why the why the army? You know, it's funny. I went into a marine recruiter. My father was a marine, so I went to a marine recruiter, and I was like, "Hey, I have a daughter, right?" So I was like, "Hey, uh, you know, I'm looking for a little bit of money to help pay for diapers and stuff," and uh, I wasn't with the mother at the time, so. Uh, I was like, is there a signing bonus? And he goes, the bonus is being a Marine. Yeah, of course. Like, I'm good. <laughs> so Never mind. They yeah. do that. That's 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 their, that's their thing, man. I think yeah. you're kind of born so a Marine. To, uh, yeah, yeah, they'll send you next yeah. door, right? Yeah. <laughs> I went to the, the Navy recruiter next because the next thing I ever, ever knew about the military is Navy SEALs, right? And so I said I wanted to be a Navy SEAL, and they said they didn't have a contract available. Uh, and so I walked out to the army guy with the next one and I was like, what's the special operations version of what you have? You know, and he explained it to me, the army and, uh, the army rangers and the, and the special forces. And I ended up scoring a 108 GT score and which made me eligible only for rangers. And so I took the ranger contract. Nice. Yeah. That was an 03. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you came in in Kentucky and then where'd, where'd you go to, uh, what was your first station? Seven- so. Yeah, the Army infantry dudes go to um, Benning, right? I did the Benning basic training there, and then I was stationed. Once I got through basic training, airborne, then RIP, right? Ranger and doctrinal program, the selection, I jumped over to a Fort Lewis uh, at 2nd Ranger Battalion. How many? How long were you there? For the four years of my active enlistment. And then you decide, when you get out of the military, you go do something completely in the same lines, but different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first little... St- then I did a prison guard thing for I was in the border patrol. Oh my gosh, <laughs> bro! I got some friends that do that, man. And that to me, that seemed to be the hardest job that we got down here. That was a tough one, man. That, I mean, it wasn't. As soon as I got the job, I applied for something else. I just like needed it. To I, pay I don't know how they do that. I mean, to see our guys in a cage, anyways. I mean, I, getting in there is one thing. I get that punishment, justice. I trust me. But then being in there, having to deal with all that, it's it's the same thing as being in prison. Probably worse because you get to go out at night and come back in there. Yeah, it was tough. It was a it was a different men's mindset you had to be in because uh, you were dealing with some some people who were just difficult. Some were just there just to do their time, and right. then some was there to try and make your life hell. Mm. Yeah, hats off to y'all, man, in, in that profession. Thank you for what you do. And then you went Bortac, right? Well, when Bor Star, I was attached yeah, to Bortac. Yeah, I went to the Border Patrol, and the process you had to do your two years first before you could even try out. And yeah, then- so explain that to get a job in the Border Patrol. You yeah. have to have so, you have had to adju- have a job before you even apply, correct? Yeah. So to apply for the border patrol was just like a two year process. It took took forever, but once you get in the border patrol, it took you still have a two years to even be considered a journeyman. So two years of hopefully you don't screw anything up where they can kick you out and fire you. Once you get that two year journeyman under your belt, and that's going through testing and and like you know field training officer stuff. Uh, and then you're eligible for all the different programs that the Border Patrol has. And what's the difference? We, my my cousin is married to a Border Patrol down in Harlingen, so we get to go down there quite often and visit with the stations. We, oh, they're high on my radar right now. I'm yeah. trying to get them all the back end, all the attention, everything I can do to make sure. You let me know, man. We got some. We're doing it right now. Yeah. We're doing it right now. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that in a second. But what is the difference between? Because we just saw these guys, the Boar Star and the Boar Tack. Yeah, so that's a fun one. Always is. Yeah, Bartak is the tactical version. 
version of the Border Patrol. They are the SWAT team of the Border Patrol. They're the top dogs. They're, they're the number one shooters, if you will. Uh, they have the shooting capabilities, warrant, warrant all this stuff. Boar Star is kind of like the pararescue jumpers of the Border Patrol. We are search trauma rescue medics, uh, but we're wow, also that shooters sounds as like well. Fun so, too. That, that, that seems like you'd be get a lot more action doing that now than you would up on the rifle, right? It, it's insane. It's got to be. It was. It was yeah, insane. The work we had to do once I I picked that because I, I kind of was like, well, let me see the medical side of my life because I, I've always been in the medical side. I enjoyed it. The infantry side, I was like, I'm done running and gunning. That side of me was the military can keep that. Um, but then right away, you know, they said, hey, your background's Ranger. I'm like, yeah, you're infantry. Yeah. They're like, you know, uh, CQB, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of like my world. Well, we're trying to really grow the tactical medicine version of Borstar. I'm like, well, let's do it. So I helped write the SOPs for for what 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 became like the TAC Med program, integrating them into BORTAC. I helped with that. And so, you know, BORSTAR, now you'll have your BORSTAR agents who are focused in tactical medicine who are attached to BORTAC in their missions. Mm -hmm. And so my when my last year was just attached to BORTAC, running and gunning as the medic, but still in the stack doing the job, which was, which was the highest honor to be able to uh, be a part of that. Yeah. Were you a medic in the Rangers? No, I was an infantryman. All right, dude. Okay, so I went through the, the medic training in, in the teams. The we all go to the same school. Rangers, SEALs, Green Berets, PJs, all have to go through the same program, it, yeah. which is great, by the way. You know, when you kind of get, when you're young, you don't know any of this. I, this is kind of what, if I could teach the young guys in, and I actually remember the older guys telling me this now, they're like, hey, take your time, have a freaking blast. I mean, have a, if you're young going through the programs, that's your life. Enjoy every freaking second of it, man. Because once I got out and had time to reflect on how much fun we actually had while we were in, you remember the stuff they let us do, bro? <laughs> Can you freaking believe that? The stuff that we got to do going through yeah. all those programs? And then, I mean, and then followed on, you get to come back home and do that. The, that Bortac and Bort Star, from, from what I've seen now, I, I never studied it. I didn't know. And you know, every program keeps their stuff top secret. They're like, hey, yeah. what do you do? Like, oh, I can't talk about it. Okay, I'm an asshole then, whatever. But it is man they're programs in the military and the civilian jobs they transfer over the yeah board yeah the board, the board i was highly impressed and extremely like surprised and how thorough and how well versed their medical programs were how how well they're just the selection program alone i gave it so much respect because i was like this is going to be this, this is not the military i'm not worried about it and it, they they jacked me up me it was you. a challenge it was I hey, respect the hell out of it. The war that's going on down there right now, just the fact that they're the only ones dealing, there's some guard down there, excuse me, but they're handling that. That yeah. ought to let you know how squared away they are. Now they're going through a transitional period right now. There's no way you get your ass kicked like that and don't come out different. Like right. we're, our, our generation came back from the two wars and now we're in this and we're about to take over and all this is learning for us. This is what we've been yeah. doing, just learning. I mean, I hope everybody understands that. This is how our generation learns. But there is no way we're not going to come out of that, especially them, stronger. Yeah, yeah. I go down there and speak to them quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I still help with a lot of little things like consulting for the Border Patrol. And it's incredible to see how overwhelmed they are at right now at the moment and how they feel. Like the morale of the Border Patrol is pretty low as a whole from special operations all the way down just to boots on the ground. Uh, people are doing it day in, day out. So uh, it's tough. It's tough to watch. It's tough to be in my position. It's kind of why I write the, wrote the book. I kind of felt bad for for what was happening. And since I have a little bit of a platform, I was like, well, let's just tell the story of the career field. So cold and flu season is right around the corner, and we've got the ultimate prescription-saving superhero on our side. It's called GoodRx. GoodRx is your go-to app for incredible savings with discounts of up to 80% on your prescription meds. It is so simple. Just hop on over to their website or app, find what you need, and bam, you've got your money-saving coupon right there. But here's the real kicker. GoodRx is your VIP pass to all major pharmacies that you know and love, Everything like CVS, Walgreens, and a whole bunch of others out there. Plus, it doesn't matter if you have insurance or not, GoodRx may still swoop in and beat your insurance copay price. I am also a very proud user of GoodRx myself, and whenever I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, I always turn to GoodRx and just watch the savings pile up. I also share this money-saving tool with all my friends and family, and they cannot stop raving about their big savings. It is absolutely amazing so here's the deal 
don't let this cold and flu season drain your wallet. Go head on over to goodrx.com slash TNQ for those jaw-dropping prescription savings. Remember, GoodRx is not insurance, but it is your golden ticket to staying healthy without breaking the bank. So don't wait. Go check out goodrx.com slash TNQ today. Yeah. So will you get into the details of yeah. the book, yeah. basically? Yeah, it's crazy. So the book, essentially, what I what I wrote about is about my career field of like, let me explain it to people in a way it's digestible because too many people um, want to blame the border patrol for everything, or they make them the, the, they're the bad guy. When in our immigration system, the border patrol has one job. It's to apprehend any individuals crossing the border illegally. That's their only job. They take them in, process, hand them off to ICE. And so a lot of the scrutiny that they were getting is like kids in cages and so on and so forth was completely misunderstood and 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 was just used in a way to kind of do politicizing them. You know, they made them the target. And in doing that, it, it just furiated me because uh, there's no way that people understand this. Their job is the most important job that you have in this nation right now. They are the front line frontline personnel stopping any terrorist actions coming across that border, potentially. Mm -hmm. Yes, infused in that is immigration, people who probably just want to do migrant workers and so on and so forth, but there's no way of telling who is who and what is what. So what they do is just as important as any kind of military operation overseas. They're doing it on our own turf. They're protecting us directly. And for them to get scrutinized the way they have been recently, it, it just was hard to watch. And so in this book, I tell my story as a Border Patrol agent from every detail, what I've done all the way into the special operations to show and also humanize the badge. Like these are these are Americans who have chosen to defend our nation on our own soil, and they do it daily with very little support. And it's a thankless job. And they're put into the middle of the media and politicians who use them as pawns instead of appreciating that they are doing the most single handed, most important job we have these days. How about that? How about that for our, our leaders? Mm -hmm. The fact that our leaders don't actually figure this stuff out behind doors instead of arguing in front of us, then they went and actually bitched out the kids, mm -hmm. like slapped the kids, slapping the kids around in front of all of us. Like we're all having to watch our brothers and sisters get whipped by our leadership. You know how much that pisses me off? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's I, a tough dude, position to be in right now. It's the weird, it's the weirdest time tough, to that, see. Yeah, that's what they signed up for. They signed up to wear that expensive suit. And to make those decisions, I was talking to him, my, my brother the other day, and he goes, Hold you know, up. when the TV, when the cameras aren't on them, he's like, they get along and they do all this, and then, but when as soon as the cameras come on them, they flip the switch and they do that, they argue and they bicker. I was like, so what I mean, what you're telling me is, instead of being an adult, a parent in the room, you actually go out and argue in front of the kids, and then when the kids aren't there, you're you're cordial to each other. I was like, you know, no. that's a backwards way of teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough. It, it's it's a it's a weird time right now. What? Absolutely. But we're in that transition. It's, it's almost, it's, it's undeniable. Yeah. So yeah. when you went down there, that was what, like six months ago or so that you spent a significant yeah, amount of time? Yeah, I, I just went down there to kind of see, because when I went down there a few months back, it was the transition from the whole, um, what was it, Title 42. Uh, it was something that was implemented during COVID, right? And that was implemented uh, to to kind of protect us from illegal immigrants or illegal migrants coming across and carrying the virus potentially. Uh, what it ended up happening was that such a huge massive influx was coming across that it, it changed everything. It, it, they stopped focusing on the Title 42 for some reason. And eventually I went down to the border because there was a huge influx of, of migrants trying to come across and hoping that when Title 42 ends, you'll go back to the original, you know, it's Title 8, it's 1325. Uh, essentially, if you, you enter in you illegally, you get processed. But that whole thing was a very controversial moment. So I want, I want to be there because there was there was thoughts that they were going to just rush across the border. I'm like, well, let's go see. Uh, it didn't happen that way. It, it's it's a very interesting thing. What happens in with the migrants down south for anyone coming from the, the southern border is that information is disseminated really well. 
to the point where they know exact policies and when they change by the date and time and so that they know how to use it to their advantage. You know, a lot are coming across and saying it's a, a, a political asylum. And, and, you know, we're a country that accepts a political asylum case and actually has to investigate that and determine whether that's real or not. And if it is, we do our best to, to, to bring them in. But when you tell someone, hey, if you just claim political asylum, you'll be good. That's what's happening. And so you have 20,000 people coming across saying, oh, political asylum, political asylum. Uh, and then it, then what we do as a country is we just take them in and we start to investigate that. There's no system in place that can house that many individuals. There's no system that has ever been in place in our country that can hold them for the time being while they determine how who's actually a political asylum case and who's not. Right. Because we only have I think it's like 67. I don't even know how many, but immigration judges who who have to set up, you know, the, their case. And that is close to a six to eight month um, period of time before they could even see the case. So, so you're telling me we have to host all these individuals, hold them here, find a way to feed them, give them medical attention and hold them as if they are seeking asylum until we can determine whether it's real or not. Like that's what's happening right now that our systems are completely overwhelmed and it won't stop because they're telling they're calling back home and saying yo they're still letting us in they're letting us in so like you might as well keep them coming and just keep claiming political asylum so i'm not of, the type of guy that's a I, i'm not against immigration like this nation's based and built on immigration but part of our our system what's in place now is immigration policy and then you have homeland security right we have to protect our nation we also have to be a nation that is gracious towards immigration that's yeah who I, we are. I understand that but we, what's we happening work. now is it's how do you do that right now when you were so overwhelmed you can't there's no way to decipher this anymore yeah i get we are a nation of immigrants but we we, we built the nation not only have yeah. we built it people have died for it already I mean, it was still bleeding for it. I got plenty of flesh on the ground. I know you do. Yes, sir. So we got some damn rules down here now. <laughs> I'm not really sure why we're picking them up. Like why you got to do all that for them if they broke in. It's, like, it's pretty clever. Break into jail to get whatever you want and then they'll let you out. Yeah. I, I get it. And humans by nature will figure it out. Yeah. So who do you think is responsible for their excellent mass communication? Because they are being updated. That has to be an organized, uh, some form of organized communication. That and yeah. what they're sneaking up the side when we're looking at the other thing. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's totally different, but like just the communication piece, it's impressive yeah. that they can. But no, it's it's extremely impressive. I don't think we have anything in place currently in our nation that, that, that has such good communication. I have no idea how they do it. Um, some would want to say it's drug, uh, excuse me, a human trafficking organizations, but I, I don't think, I think it's more than that. I think it's just, they're all just calling their families and calling their families as soon as they hear something, as soon as they know, hey, I crossed over this border in Del Rio. I got in in, in four days. I already have my walking papers. Oh, I, Tell everybody. I got a pretty good idea because they keep it simple. Mm -hmm. yep. Like they got one mission and that's to get where it is. So the only thing that comes into their field of view are what needs to go to get the mission done. Not all yeah. the not everything we have to look at before we even know what's going on. It's like as soon as you turn on the TV in our world, they throw so much crap at the screen that that you got to pick through it for a while. When you, it's like this is how the Afghans fought so well, but they didn't have all that tech. It, nothing got in the way. It's like because when you boil a fight down or anything down, it's human on human, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the more armor you have, sometimes the the worse it makes it for you, man. Yeah, it's, it's something that's so streamlined that uh, the information, that's why Del Rio has a huge influx. You know that they're taking in individuals, they're processing them fast, and then they're sending them on their way. And they're, they're getting, a, it's called a notice to appear, an NTA. They're essentially giving their papers to go into America and show up on this date for your immigration judge hearing, uh, which doesn't necessarily happen. And so the message is getting out. There's no repercussions. There's There's... There's no, uh, you know, we've incentivized essentially them coming across. And oh. so it's going to continue to happen. Yeah. You know what it looks like sometimes someone said this to me is like, so the, so in the last eight years, roughly, so that first last administration, everyone got upset and pissed off about what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we, so we've already been mad about it, but now it's actually happening. Mm -hmm. How about that for a damn conundrum? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's yeah. exactly what's happened. It's like, hey, man, we've already been mad about this, so people aren't paying attention to it, but it's actually going down right now. Yeah. 
When we went down, we were able to visit a lot of the stations in the Rio Grande Valley, but one of them that we went to was Fort Brown. And they were saying that like over 3,000 Chinese immigrants have come through since January. Yeah, that, yeah, that's not uncommon. That is one of the scariest things to me is just, yes, I agree, there does need to be a form of you know immigration. There needs to be a legal form of immigration, but it's not just migrant workers. Who are these Chinese coming through? Who are all of these Middle Easterns coming yeah. through, the Africans? And what, what is the purpose of them coming? Now, you know, because America ultimately is a tradition. Mm -hmm. It's like we have our ways, we have baseball, football, we have sports. Man, uh, be, an American is a thing, and it goes back. Like I said, we already bled for it, so it kind of put it in, on, in stone. So when people come over, man, especially not just individually and in the thousands, I'm talking about millions. When they come over like that, and then they don't yeah. know how we actually do things, because the way we actually do things is not the way it is on TV. It, it's not. Right. There's that middle world that we live in, and we actually live in here. And when they don't know that, and it, it's just like, it's it's worlds colliding. You're talking about people who've never seen, sometimes no, not electricity, to walking into we have this. Mm -hmm. It's almost yeah. the equivalent of someone seeing a, a, v, a truck or a truck for the first time and a human jumping in it, and then that truck comes alive. It's like, holy shit, what happened? And he's like, that, that, that thing's powered by a human? I mean, you, that's how different the world is right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see, you know, the way they they label uh, individuals that are not from, you know, South America. They call them exotics, and so the are you exotics kidding me? are definitely coming across in, in ex crazy numbers. So, what it, when when you were down there, even when you were Borstar, what were some of the scariest things that you encountered, being, you know, an American, just thinking, gosh, I I wish this policy was different, or I wish what. What are some of the things that frightened you the most? Well, it's tough to see the real numbers when you, so anybody who comes across illegally that's apprehended by us, they get their fingerprints rolled, right? And we, we, we try and identify their identity and everything else. And to see the numbers of murderers, of rapists, of pedophiles that come across, that we catch, that we actually catch, it's pretty intimidating to think of how many we actually miss, right? Because there is no such thing as a 100% secure border. There never has been, right? There's always gonna be leaks somewhere in that border just because it's so vast, right? And we don't have enough people guarding it essentially. And so when you see the ones we do catch, the concern is like, shit, who do we miss? And that is always a concern. That's always a thought process of mine. And I think that's also a thought process of a lot of ours that are like apprehend as many individuals as you can because we'll let the computers decipher it. We'll let the someone else do their job, but we have to stop everyone because you never know so if you had a magic wand and you could put in any policy in place, what would you do to change the border? That's a tough, you know, I, I focus a lot on the border patrol as a, as a career field and what they can use more of. Uh, and you know, obviously more boots on the ground support would be super valuable for them. Uh, I don't think the border patrol should be the one holding and housing like they are now because that actually takes them off the line from what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's two two things we can do. We can't incentivize people coming over illegally, right? That doesn't make sense to me. When you incentivize people coming over illegally, you're blatantly ignoring, you know, the own the the, the policies that are already in place, you know, and so that's an issue that for some somehow some way. We're, we're giving them more for coming across illegally when the act of it as a policy is breaking yeah, you the actually, law. You actually it's, get it's, something. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, I'm, we're not talking about just punishing you, but we're like, they reward you for that. Mm -hmm. A ride, right. some money, a phone. Medical care. Medical, the best. Right. Mm -hmm. right, so we can't incentivize coming over illegally. And and that's, you know, if they come over as in a seeking asylum and it was uh, it is determined that is a fact, well, then that's a different story and we'll handle that accordingly. But that's not true for most. You can't seek, uh, say you're seeking asylum because your country uh, is someone else is threatened. It's seeking asylum means that you credible fear for their life, for their situation personally. And so it's a blanket statement that's used to to help people come across illegally. And, it, and right now it's working, you know, it shouldn't be. And then the other side of it is, I think we need to, we need to you know, find a way to 
be able to educate those other countries and see why is it that they're fleeing from those countries? How can we assist in those countries keeping their people and not wanting to come across, but also educating those who are being manipulated by trafficking organizations, right? So two parts, if we can educate and we can help uh, those other countries be more fruitful in some way, shape or form capacity, right? I think that energy to me is better spent than other things like Ukraine or whatnot. But I'm saying if we can we can show them how to have a better existing country themselves, then there would be no need to come to America. You know, they would be fruitful on their own. Uh, lead by example, you mean? Mm-hmm. Like sure. if we just led by example. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that we learned when we were down there is that a lot of the kids that are coming through with adults aren't actually their kids. And some of the Border Patrol agents kind of dimed it, coined it as a, a rent a kid from the cartel that they would just basically rent these kids out to people that wanted to come over so they were with a family and yep. the kids under the age of 13 are by our policy are not allowed to be fingerprinted or dna which to me that is legalizing human trafficking yeah so check it out the, the, this the, the our leadership right now will let a strange man show up to the house with a kid that's not his mm-hmm. give him a phone money and a bus ticket way up into the city somewhere and not keep track of him i'm like yeah. man what are you doing with that kid yeah. it's not their kid you know it's not mm-hmm. yeah but then they put the rules in place so we can't check yeah something's going on man that's too damn thin that doesn't even yeah, pass the smell test down here man what yeah, are we, i mean a, seriously yeah, that's a you know that was kind of the weird thing when people were getting upset about the kids in cages, right? It yeah. was like you're getting upset about the optics of what that looks like, but you don't really understand the process of what we have to do to determine if that is their parent or not, and is to separate. You remember when you when you grabbed a bunch of of dudes overseas, you had to separate them, oh, right? Sure. You, you, immediately. you ask questions individually. Yeah. You don't allow them to talk. Sure. It's the same exact process when you're when you're dealing with kids in immigration who come over with so-called parents. Well, I need to investigate that. I need to put them in a position where they feel safe, where they're not threatened by the individual. And so let's ask questions then. We're talking about kids. Mm-hmm. And anybody who's a parent knows this. When they're in a situation, when they're stressed, that kid will be clinging to the father. Mm-hmm. Clinging. And when you so when we're sitting there looking at these kids with these adult men, they, they, you know it's not their kid. Yeah. Because the kid's more scared of the of that man than he is a situation. Yeah, we yeah. were able to go. This was back in the Trump administration when they were when the media was saying kids in cages. We went down there and visited some of the the centers, and it was mostly just thirty year olds, thirty somethings men with small children and we were like what the hell where's the women there were not hardly any women with them it was just a dude and a kid and yeah and yeah yeah and to understand the process of that too now now they get processed as a family unit right not as an individual so it's actually a more lenient charge and and they get treated a little bit better right and that's when i realized oh my gosh they our country has legalized human trafficking because we're not even allowed to see if that How about that? If that is a real family unit we spend all that money to, to end human trafficking overseas man and we're the one it's funneling through here like crazy now yeah and we're allowing it it's a, it's a crazy time How about our leadership huh good job <laughs> one of the things that i thought was interesting and i don't know if what your take on this is when we do have migrant workers or even just people seeking asylum and they get here and they get a visa or whatever it is that they get for the longest time they're working and they're not taxed why not tax those immigrants more than anybody else is taxed and actually get some money back from them yeah i don't know the process on that i've heard a lot about it i think there's there's a system now that if they are part of it they're they're starting to get taxed but i personally don't I don't know the depth of that one at all. Um, that's always an interesting one for me is there's individuals who come here to work and then they send their money back home, which for me, it's like, well, I believe in the longevity of America. And so right. you should be investing back into the economy of America, right? For me is what I would like to see, because that means that you believe in what we have here. You came here because you believed in what we did we have. 
And then let's continue to make this fruitful for those who who want to come here in the future as well. You know, and so that's kind of the side that I would hope to see more of. But in the taxing side, I, I know there's been a few states that do have the taxes, but I don't know. Like I said, I'm more focused on on the border the border patrol career field than like some of the crazy nuances of of immigration after they're sure. already here. I think there's a lot of things down here. I've I've learned over time, man, is that you can get wrapped around the axle about right and wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are two different types living down here. Obviously we can see that now. Some things will never come to see eye to eye on. They just won't. Mm -hmm. So the, the right and wrong, that's gotta be out the window. It's gotta be, Hey, is that working or not? Yeah. Does it just, does that work? Cause if it works, then yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at it. And we'll try to refine it. But if it doesn't, then right or wrong doesn't even matter. I was like, uh, you can tell by your people, Man, you don't even have to watch the TV to tell you that America is stressed right now. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when, when our look, and it was so damn hot last summer, it was apologize hot. Like I walk outside and say, I'm sorry, I didn't even do anything wrong. That kind <laughs> yeah, of hot. So when people yeah. are pissed because they're hot, that, that just automatically upsets people. And then you throw all this on top of us. It's amazing that we're held it together this long. No, yeah. I mean, this, it's, it's just heated up. I mean, somebody's yeah. got to take the foot off of our throat because eventually Americans, they, once we had enough, man, we'll kill ourselves. That's what America will do that. Yeah, the past 10 days have been a massive influx on the Del Rio sector, just south of where you guys were at, right? If you guys went to RGV, there's a couple, I think it's close to 11,000 uh, have come across in the past like 10 days. And they're so overwhelmed that more people are processing than working the line. Now, there's people still working the line, but you they're so overwhelmed with resources the city of eagle pass the city of del rio they're just completely like this is insane sure and and, and they're so overwhelmed that once they're done with the processing again they get their ntas and so that's potentially eleven thousand people getting released back into the united states waiting for their court date and whether they show up or not is to be determined yeah it's not their fault it's that there's a waiting list that long it's not yeah. And let me tell you something. The cartels, I was watching something the other day, man, they're what they're they're a large organization. They're about the size of Target, is what they said, right? And you <laughs> you said that the border was so big. You're right. Now that this has started to happen to them, they consolidated all of our troops in the areas they know where they're at. So when they see an influx going in through there, they know where the troops are. There's enough border that whatever's coming in on the other side, no one will ever see it. We just don't yeah. have, the, we just, and, and you know that's the case. Those guys are so smart. They know every, the cartels actually know every inch of the border and they run yep. it. So they know exactly what they can push through there and what they can't. And we yeah, have I no mean, way the, of understanding the, that. The, the massive influx of, of fentanyl coming from China, you know, comes from South America, right? It comes through the south border, southern border. Yep. And so all those issues all are, it, 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 it's the same We need process, to make that right? crap like, an enemy of the state. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl? Like you get caught bringing that over the border, man. You got to chew it. <laughs> if I catch you with that shit coming over and poison my people again, I'm gonna make you eat all of it. <laughs> I'm messing around, dude. Wait till I get the law, yeah. dude. This is why Marcus is. That's not why I can't run for politics, man. Mojo's got the, the the panache, whatever that word. I don't have that. Can like you if you me? came over here to kill my people, man, wait till you see what I can do to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh all right well we're so excited to read your book because yeah, thank obviously you. Go square away man thanks for doing that i mean personally we are very um emotional about border patrol too we have family in it our um, texans man i'm just you know how we are bro you're one now yeah sure. my, my wife's a texan you married so well, yeah that's sorry if you get if you get a hold of one of our females and you marry into it, it makes you one. That's that's a thing. Otherwise, you got to be born here. So, <laughs> you filmed some of that too, didn't you? When you went down for Title Forty Two. Yeah, we filmed some of that. You know, I got a little bit of clips of that. It's tough, man. I'm trying to get the approvals from the border patrol to. I don't want to piss off my own my own group of people. As oh, well, I get right? it, man. Those yeah, my brothers. And so absolutely. We're, we're right now working on getting more approvals to go down there and film and and show the, the you know the border patrol in a good light that they deserve and the truth. You know, the guys that were in the Uvalde, you know, Rob Elementary, those were my former Borstar team and, and Bortec team that I was attached to. So I'm always trying to bring light to those guys and support them in any way, shape or form I can. And so I continue to do consulting for them and I continue to do like mental health and wellness uh, retreats and stuff like that for them. Well, if you ever want our help, we're we're down to go. We've gone down there twice to do morale boost and uh, we've only gone to RGV though. Um, but we'll go anywhere that you 
want to yeah, go. Yeah, we'll and- set up Del Rio sector. I'll get a call with them right now. They're probably the hardest hit sector currently right now. They're the ones that had to deal with the, the horse whipping incident, the non-whipping oh. incident. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Haitian Don't even get me started right? about the that one, man. Also dealt with the Rob Elementary as well. And currently right now, the massive influx that's coming through, they're dealing with that. So they're getting hit pretty hard. So a good morale boost would be great. I, I try to reach out to Mojo. I wanted him to come check it out with me as well. It don't uh, matter, but you guys tell me when. Yeah, I'll rattle we'll set, we'll set up a couple of days and go down there. All right. We would love that. Um, real quick, I follow you on Instagram. Marcus isn't big on actually being on Instagram, so I, I share all of this with him. I'm his actual friend. I, well, I, I, know. Okay. I know. I'm, not, I'm just saying you don't see. I, tell I see you, you diming this. me out on the other I side know. of this microphone. I'm not typing you out. <laughs> What I'm saying is one of the things that I respect most about you is the family side of you. Do you want to say anything about your wife and kids? Oh, man, no. It's just, uh, you know, we're a blended family. We have eight kids, and we we, we try to manage it. Our That's two right, dude. Are now you got a tribe over there, bro. And, yeah, our kids are all in sports, and it's just a blast. And, you know, if you, you know I, all the things you see I do is all – I'm doing it for them. I want to be a righteous man in their eyes and hopefully – you know, kind of the lead from the front uh, motto. If I can be here and do the righteous thing for our country, for for my God and for my family, um, I hope to to teach them in that same sense. And so, that's why my family's on my social media the whole time as much as possible because that's the big part of my life. I love it. How old's your oldest? She's twenty, turning twenty one soon. Aw, they're all so pretty and handsome. Such a beautiful <laughs> family. Thank you. Well, we live in we live in Dallas now, so we're gonna have to connect. We have to get the families together. Uh, well, yeah, we're definitely gonna do that. Yeah, and no. we'll definitely get together with Morgan, and we'll all go down to the border. Um, my cousin's husband just got out of MRT training. Oh, cool! I used to teach that. Oh, fun! So it's not fun. Well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's not fun. It's not fun. I used to, nah, I used to jack them up. I used to jack them up. I can assure you that word and that school don't go together. Well, I'm proud of him. Um, we, we're proud of him yeah. and, and all the Border Patrol. We love Border Patrol, and I think that there needs to be more resources for them. Uh, when we were down there, one of the things that they said is that um, one of the public relations ladies said, it feels like we're kind of like the the ugly stepchild of America because, you know, veterans come back, even law enforcement have all these foundations to support them, support their mental health, support when someone is uh, terminally ill in the family or something, but there's really nothing set up for Border Patrol. There's very little. Yeah, I think there may be two organizations that focus on Border Patrol and those are both from from former, uh, you know, from widowed wives. Um, you know, we started doing the light diffuse wellness retreats for that same reason, because a lot of my brothers who, who, who brothers and sisters who served are struggling. And so we're working on, I've gone down to talk to them about wellness and introduce them to several different modalities. And I'll continue to pursue that. You guys, we'll, we'll talk offline about how we can host something for, for, yeah, we'll for one of the out. other yeah. uh, chapters or one of the other um, sectors and, and continue to come, hopefully boost their morale because they just, they feel forgotten down there, you know? Yeah. And so when someone like us goes down and shakes her hand and spends a day with them it feels good to know that that they're still appreciated when we went down there uh i mean this was like two weeks ago or three weeks ago they said that there were six suicides this year yep. um and actually the week after we left one of the guys that couldn't even make it to one of your speeches he committed suicide too so now it's seven just in rio Grande valley Yep, I know. So, That's who I go speak to often. Yeah. Actually, just I, before you guys got there, probably three weeks prior to that, I was there. They told us. And I speak, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's that's what I, you know, that's what the consulting that I do with them is focused more on the resiliency and wellness side of things and how we can, you know, introduce different ways of, uh, you know, fixing some of that stress that they seem to, to, to not be able to get off of their shoulders. And as well as why I wrote the book, hopefully it's a boost of morale. It humanizes the badge. It lets people know what they do and it lets them show them that there's a voice out there that supports them. All right. So how can people find the book? You can pre-order right now in any kind of book place from Amazon to Barnes and Noble, uh, the audio book, I'm finishing it up next week and the book comes out November 14th. Uh, it is, like I said, on pre-order. We're hoping to just blow it out so I can go and continue to to hopefully be an advocate for the border, uh, hopefully continue to be a subject matter expert of the Border Patrol career field and, and speak very highly of a career field that I adore. Awesome. All right, on, brother. We'll so, back you any way we can, man. I'm being told to ask one more question. Okay. Tell us about Range 15 and your experience with it. 
Well, range 15 was like, <laughs> I was happy to, to help put that together. Uh, I was, it was a great time to, to meet Marcus and actually spend time with him. What a blast. But as well as it's what kicked off my career in the writing in Hollywood space. You know, if it wasn't for range 15, I never would have been inspired to continue pursuing acting. I did, you know, five years on a television show and also as a writer on that show. And, you know, I just got off the phone right before this call for a potential new show that we were working on. So you know, 15, the, the head start I needed to get into the community. America needs the writers to go back to work. I mean, yeah, we, if, if the yeah. movies aren't good, if there's nothing for us to be entertained out here, we'll start tearing some stuff up. <laughs> so if y'all, you know what I'm talking about? Like, uh, we, we need y'all. I, I, mean, I get the break. We had one. We miss you. We love you. I get y'all's asses back to work, man, because we're running out of stuff to do. Yeah, I agree. All I right. agree. Well, cool, and man. as you can see, or as you probably learned, a lot of people think that Marcus is mostly serious, but he, the best side of him is his comedy side. And I think that showed during probably the filming of Range 15. And we yeah. We blast. yeah, he has such a funny side to him and loves playing jokes and pranks and all of that. So I thought that was such a fun time for him to be able to do that with y'all. It was great. Yeah. All right, brother man. God bless you. Take care. Yeah, God family. bless you as well. See you guys. All right, brother. Thank you. We'll connect. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. So, yeah. Thank you so much for coming down. We really appreciate you. Uh, I guess through Zoom, but go check out his new book coming out November fourteenth. Uh, go check out his Instagram. He's always doing something. It seems like. Uh, so with that being said, we will see you guys next week. This is the Team Never Quit podcast. podcast. Don't buckle up, buttercup.